Hello everyone and a very good morning to all of you. Distinguished delegates, speakers and participants from South Member States and other regions of India. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm very thankful to all of you for joining us in this webinar. My name is Dasan Javed and I'm working as a research fellow in Renewable Energy at South Energy Center for Pakistan. I shall be moderating today's webinar, the aim, the aim of which is to introduce and familiarize the professional with those latest technologies which are being used in the drone for inspection, operation and maintenance of power transmission lines in South Member State. The webinar shall introduce or include best practices, case studies, and latest technology employed by the electric utility company. I am grateful to our elite panel of speakers such as Dr. Yang Wong from China, Mr. Morris Bank Michael from Netherlands, and Mr. Rahul Junior from India for their enthusiasm and eager willingness to participate. We are very thankful to them. I shall introduce them in before we start of their relevant session. Dear participants, you will have the opportunity to ask questions to presenters. You may send in your questions at any time during the presentation. We will collect these and address them during each question after question at the end of the presentation. With this, now I may like to request uh, Mr. Rahul Union for his presentation. Mr. Rahul is the aviation expert getting the aviation drones and helicopter and technology projects from Satellite Power India, part of a big conglomerate, the Delta Group. Over the last five years, Rahul has led multiple aviation projects, which were first of their kind in transmission industry and in India. He is also mentoring few drone and other technical based startups in India. His education is BTEC in electrical engineering, MD in energy and operations management, post graduate diploma in transmission and distribution systems. He is a Six Sigma certified professional with project management certification. Over to Rahul. Thank you. Uh, hi, a very good morning uh, from my side. Uh, thank you, Hassan, for such a generous introduction. So I think uh, uh, without further ado, we need to start because we have we have uh, lost a couple of minutes initially. So I think uh, just to start, I would, uh, I would like to give a, a brief introduction about my company. So currently I'm working at, as you can as you guys can see the logo. Currently I'm working at Starlight Power. So Starlight Power is one of the leading power transmission developer here in India, and we hold currently around seven. Uh, over over 11,000 circuit kilometers of line uh, and also some giga, uh, I mean some big uh, substation projects here in India, right? So, I mean, just to directly start with the topic. So as far as the, uh, the drone global trend is concerned, as you can see on the left hand side of my screen. <clears throat> so, uh, in from uh, the the global trend basically started from 2017. I mean, it started way before than that, but I would say that in 2017 it got in, it uh, really started at a nascent stage. And uh, I mean, there is you can see there is a forecast of 2025 as well, wherein the expected uh, drone global service market is considered to be at around 66 or around 65 billion dollars globally right so this is uh, uh, this is an estimation which has been taken uh, by uh, i mean one of the global you know consulting firms so uh, this is how it is and we are we are somewhere here wherein you know in the yellow you can see the middle east market asia pacific contributing a lot and the american market the north american market uh, which us is the main customer is contributing uh, a lot in the in this uh, on the left hand side on the right hand side you can see uh, that we are somewhere above this particular uh, you know the market segment uh, or uh, in terms of the the attractive opportunities in the drone service so i mean it is in sync with today's uh, topic because today we are focusing on drone usage in the transmission industry so the uh, the usage of uh, of drones in the transmission industry basically lies in the drone service so drone as a tool has got both the elements uh, the the hardware as well as the software part so in the in the onm we basically deal with both the hardware usage as well as the software usage right and as you can see uh, till 2025 it is expected to be at around uh, you know uh, to grow at a cagr of around uh, 55 56 percentage 
So again, uh, this particular slide showing uh, some global trends. So as you guys can see that uh, uh, that in the infrastructure segment, it is the topmost, uh, which is you know. Uh, uh, the next is the agriculture, transport, security, right? Media, entertainment, and insur uh, insurance. The the uh, the key highlight. So the key highlight here is that uh, in the infrastructure space, it's around 45 by two. So uh, the transmission sector again comes in the same segment because all the power transmission projects or the distribution projects come in the same infrastructure segment, right? So as you can see. Uh, on the right hand side, the different applications of drone technology. So yes, surveying is one of the major chunk. Uh, so uh, in, in survey, it's basically the topographical survey and it is across industries where, it, I mean, it's infrastructure, it's energy, it's power, it's in the roadway, uh, railways, it's in the highways. And uh, the same trend is being followed in India as well. I mean, there is rapid ramp up of, uh, you know, drone uh, usage in terms of topographical survey and analysis wherein we calculate the cut and fill in the survey part inspection uh, so the entire onm falls under this category contributes to around 50 53 percent of the total you know the industrial drone applications so coming to coming to an important slide here what we uh, what we as a company do here in india right so as you can see uh, drone basically in the transmission industry can be utilized uh, right so so as you can see in this particular slide so the drone in the transmission industry can be used in three phases in the bidding phase in the construction phase and in the operation and maintenance phase we won't be going much in detail in the bidding and construction phase as our agenda today is the operation and maintenance phase uh, if, if required, we can go in details in uh, if, if uh, I mean, we can keep a uh, separate uh, session for the bidding and the construction phase. So just to touch upon in the bidding phase uh, is the topographical survey. Let's say if you are in the bidding phase, we do the topographical survey. We do the analysis. We do the right of way mapping. So let's say people present here would be knowing what is the right of way, the, all the critical elements coming under the uh, coming over the road. We also do the volumetric analysis because of which we are able to, you know, calculate the cutting and filling benching volumes. And that is how uh, a developer or a bidder uh, comes uh, L1 or L2 according how, how good the bidding uh, analysis has been done. And that is, and on that, you can, you know, uh, get your best of the BOQs. Coming to the construction phase. So in the construction phase, we, what we are doing here in India and as a company is that we are using a drone to, you know, to pull the pre-pilot rope, the platina rope, 2.5 mm and higher grade, which uh, you know, uh, 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 which again pulls the higher uh, the steel wire rope, which is uh, used for you know uh, pulling the conductor in a iterative process. So you can even see a small uh, picture of it. We, as we, are, as we say that once the project is one, we are doing a detailed survey. We are doing construction monitoring. So a lot of construction monitoring has been done by us. We are doing ROW hotspot analysis. We are doing the habitation analysis, right? Coming on the main agenda for today, uh, what we are doing in the, in the operation and maintenance, uh, uh, as far as uh, the transmission industry is concerned here in India, we are doing uh, visual inspection. So. Uh, so just before that, I mean, when we use drone, the basic idea and the basic philosophy is uh, is uh, that we need to be doing the surveillance uh, from a remote area or it has to be from a distant area wherein our pilots, our technicians need not to go on those towers and uh, need not to climb on those 70, 80 meters towers, right? So so how, how does it happen? Let's say a pilot uh, or, or a drone pilot or a GIS uh, person uh, are accompanied, uh, they go as a team on ground, they, uh, you know, fly the drone uh, from a distance of around uh, uh, 1.5, 2 kilometers, even sometimes a bit more as well, depending upon how the, uh, how the connectivity of the, of the, controller and the drone is and they collect images right so so as you can see on my uh, on my right hand side so there are different applications or different outputs which we which i'm trying to highlight uh, starting from the right hand side is the visual inspection wherein an rgb normal digital camera is plugged below the drone and you get the normal digital images with these digital images you can see the uh, the visual uh, defects or any any sort of uh, you know the physical damage can be visually identified 
on the mid part of it uh, the mid picture shows you the rgb uh, rgb images wherein uh, the hotspot the corona hotspots can be de detected and this application can be used both in the lines as well as in the substation on my extreme left hand side uh, where my cursor lies you can see it's it's a uh, it's again a drone plus lidar application wherein a lidar was plugged uh, just below the drone and uh, uh, with the help of the lidar or as an output we calculate the clearances the face to face clearances we calculate the distance of the trees from the uh, from the bottom face so all these engineering calculations have been done with the help of lidar and drone right so as i was saying we do the visual inspection we do the engineering calculations uh, the height of the trees the height of the clearance face to face clearance right the clearance of the uh, the topmost earth fire or the opcw from the topmost phase we do the vegetation uh, management and we do the high ir and hotspot analysis as shown in this particular peak so again i mean uh, these slides are much uh, uh, i mean giving a, will give you a deeper view of what i was talking so in the bidding phase we we uh, we take imagery multiple imageries and we convert it into 3d model and 2d maps uh, we uh, basically uh, uh, calculate the uh, or rather generate the dtm and the dem and uh, let's say for transmission as uh, there are many transmission experts over here so let's say uh, uh, we we as an output we derive the one by one meter grid or two by two meter grid uh, for the spot elevation which is required as a survey output and that output goes into the PLS CAD uh, for for the profiling purpose and let's say any transmission utility or distribution utility with the help of drone can get a a much better you know quantified output which which uh, can be very useful uh, on my right hand side as I was saying we do a lot. of volumetric analysis whether it's a hill area or a normal area a dense area so there are different solutions uh, uh, which can be applied uh, you know as 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 per the need of a of a user and uh, we can generate contour contours and different kind of cut field analysis can be done as i was saying in the uh, in the construction phase uh, we again you know after getting a project we use drone with the dgps to do detail survey and uh, that particular output can be used uh, uh, i mean in the pls cad for doing the profiling here on my right hand side you can see a drone with a uh, uh, with a velodyne uh, light sensor so this particular bird uh, was used in one of our project for doing detail survey and for giving us the best of the outputs you know so so at the difference between a, a normal drone uh, a, a rather a drone with an rgb camera or a drone with a lidar is that uh, the uh, the drone with the rgb normal camera is used for the photogrammetry survey so this is a technical gis term and let's say a drone uh, with a lidar sensor uh, when it is used uh, for the survey it is called basically a, a lidar survey all uh, both of them are part of the gis uh, uh, i mean uh, G, G, or both can be considered as the as a gis tool wherein the photogrammetry survey is used for a much uh, you know a plain surface whereas the lidar is used when it's heavy vegetation when the canopy is pretty much dense in the construction phase i was as i was talking we do a lot of construction monitoring mis reporting is been done and drone uh, plus multiple gis surface are used by us as a company uh, to you know present it to the senior management uh, Uh, right so on the right hand side you can see the habitation analysis so what habitation analysis uh, you know uh, uh, gives us that uh, let's say once we are doing a construction line uh, a transmission line or once we are building a, a distribution line so what what amount of population is there in half a kilometer or per per meter per square meter so that is the analysis which we do which also helps us you know to distribute a lot of compensations uh, during the construction time and during the onm phase so let's say when a lines get when a line get constructed right and once the line is constructed it is given for the onm right the uh, onm team operation and maintenance team for a, of a particular company handles that line right so that onm team needs to know that what amount of habitation uh, has has you know come up over the last couple of years uh, in that particular line so drone is a fantastic tool uh, you know uh, a drone the output of the drone if coupled with multiple gis platform like our gis even with a simpler tool like uh, a simple google earth can give you fantastic outputs uh, again this is a important application which we are doing in the construction phase uh, as i was saying earlier that we are using drones uh, you know to pull the platina rope so as you can see just 
just a, 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 a imagery wherein there is a lot there is a lot of vegetation wherein you cannot cut the vegetation when it's a uh, it's a hilly terrain highly habitated terrain so we are using a lot of drone based stringing uh, you know to help with the row and other uh, geographical challenges so coming on the main agenda for today is is the operation and maintenance phase so as you guys can see there are four you know uh, 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 basically four applications on the left hand side as you can see is a uh, is a visual inspection wherein a normal uh, a normal rgb camera is used uh, for, uh, for for getting the physical uh, health of the asset right so for uh, for the sake of uh, you know giving a better understanding drone uh, is basically a platform is basically an aerial machine so it is of no use if we are not using you know a sensor or a, a payload below the drone and have multiple uh, payload applications so when i when i say payload uh, the capability of a drone to pick up a certain load right so that load could be a rgb camera a digital camera that load could be a ir camera an infrared camera and that load could be a lidar sensor right and all these payloads all these sensor can have multiple applications right so as you can as you guys can see on my left hand side it's a drone uh, with an rgb camera which is a digital camera which was used to you know to capture the physical health of the asset during the construction and the onm phase so let's say if there is a loose bolt and nut if there is any grading ring which is uh, loose if there is any corona ring which is not in the same uh, 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 same layout so all those things can be you know uh, uh, caught during the onm phase by the onm team right uh, the next feature as i explained earlier gives the ir the infrared imagery of a particular asset and it also helps you to determine you know various hot spots in this particular uh, tower let's say if any corona ring is loosened up or if any grading ring is loosened up if if there is any moisture uh, moisture uh, uh, effect on those particular lines because as the line you know passes on from one year to another there are a lot of uh, uh, environmental effect uh, uh, over over that particular asset so the corona discharges are uh, predominantly higher uh, in the older asset as compared to the uh, new asset right so we need to know that what is the health of the asset so for that ir application uh, infrared uh, application is a, is a phenomenal tool the, this particular image in which i am focusing is a top view of a of one of our substation in the northeast part of a country where is wherein we, you can see on the outer edges a lot of vegetation right so this particular image so it's a it's a commissioned uh, 765 by 400 kv substation right uh, in the northeast part of a country in india so this particular image you know gives you two benefits it 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 gives you the top view you can also overlay a lot of uh, you know designs aspects over this particular image during the construction phase or let's say in the onm phase if you want to do any uh, you know uh, any bay extension or any uh, any expansion of the uh, the substation area is concerned second it also helps you as a surveillance tool right so in onm inspection as well as surveillance is an important aspect so when i say surveillance you know all these substations or let's say transmission lines uh, since all people are coming from the tnd industry so let's say usually a transmission line is is far far away from a i mean highly habitated area let's say it would be going from jungles from uh, you know from wildlife and sanctuaries right and let's say at and uh, uh, from areas as well which are heavy theft have prone areas so how to solve those uh, problems so drone can be used as a uh, as a as a uh, as a tool wherein in every 15 to 20 days you can take the top view of these uh, this particular asset and you can you know uh, compare the previous images with the latest images and with the help of the analytics as well you can also see that if there is any theft or any you know uh, physical uh, damage to any of your asset right so on the right hand side if if you guys can see uh, with the help of drone and lidar as a sensor as a payload uh, we were able to get the face to face clearance we can also get the ground clearance as well right so this is how uh, we people uh, are doing it and have done it over the last 4 or 5 years right uh, so i'll uh, just take you guys uh, i'll try and show you a small uh, video of uh, 
of the drone applications which we are doing or we have done over the last four five years as a company right and all these projects a uh, gentleman i mean uh, whichever uh, you know all these slides which i have shown you all the application which i have shown you uh, all these works have been done by us in india and all these projects are i mean uh, why i am vouching this because all are done uh, all have been led by me there have been certain projects which are you know the first of its kind uh, in india in the transmission industry as well right so the idea even when i was talking to asan few days back the idea of me coming here and pitching to you guys is that if i can do or let's say if we as an industry can do then obviously each and every utility across the globe especially the asian utilities can do it in a very cost effective manner so let me let me start with the video uh, and i'll try and give you some you know voice over uh, uh, with with these uh, in the in the particular video so asan i hope the video is visible yes the video is visible and uh, it's okay going right so uh, just to stop i mean this is one of the prime application of drone uh, which are we using in india uh, in the transmission industry is to you know uh, uh, put across a platina roof over hilly towers which are you know habitation terrain and all those factors come in so to escape that so this is how uh, what i was saying so as you guys can see uh, we are using as i said earlier we are using drone as a as a uh, construction monitoring tool as well you can see the foundations here the jcbs and trucks here we do a lot of monitoring of these uh, foundation depths during the time of construction right and uh, that is how we we come to know that uh, each foundation let's say is of 3.5 meter or 3.2 meters or whatever the technical parameter is assigned to it so this was one of the uh, you know the demos of the poc which we did wherein we built a uh, 3d model of the tower just by flying the drone in the poi mode and uh, using uh, uh, using pretty good uh, you know the machines so uh, this particular model helped us you know to do some realistic uh, realistic 3d model analysis and uh, realistic uh, calculations of the height of the tower and let's say what are, what were the height of the different cross arms and sections uh, to match it with the drawing so as you guys can see here so one important thing which i want to say as of now is that you know drone as a tool can give you the outputs can give you phenomenal output but yes the how to get or how to derive intelligent output from the drone is where the analytics comes into picture and where and where the the use of a gis tool comes handy right so uh, let's say for a senior management or for a project manager to visualize uh, to see that the drone output is really helpful or to or or for a drone to give a informative information uh, intelligent information that the drone output has to be clubbed with the gis gis tool uh, to give it a more uh, you know uh, intelligent information so we at sterlight and i think various utilities in india are clubbing the uh, are clubbing the drone output with the gis tool to give you a more info i mean uh, intelligent information
so this is the asset monitoring part i mean uh, we do a lot of uh, drone for you for capturing high 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 uh, quality images and uh, you know the uh, the videos which gives uh, the feel of uh, the uh, quality of the particular asset uh, we have done a lot of uh, you know drone based inspection in our asset during the construction and the onm phase uh, to give the perfect view of the health of the asset <laughs> just for the conclusion so we as a company i have used multiple helicopters you know the uh, the heavier lift helicopter which you are seeing it was a heli crane which had used in 2016 17 for construction of real towers uh, in one of our line which was passing in the nrss in the kashmir valley uh, nowadays we are using lighter uh, helicopters we have used uh, we have done it in uh, in three last projects over the last two years and uh, we have been uh, using helicopters for the logistic work wherein the terrain is a challenge so this is i mean uh, kind of an uh, additional application of uh, you know the aviation or i would say uh, here the platform changes from drone to helicopter so uh, in the end i would uh, you know try and show you uh, a recent uh, a, a recent uh, uh, use of uh, uh, use of drone with the lidar so what we did here was i mean uh, we uh, we create we we did uh, a lidar based inspection over one of our asset a 760 kv double circuit asset so as you can see a sketch circuit 1 and circuit 2 so i think for most of the transmission utility guys over here it, it would be a uh, area of interest wherein we had tried to showcase that this is the uh, this is one tower this is another tower this is circuit 1 element this is circuit 2 element right and we also you know uh, graphically we also tried to differentiate the top mid and bottom part right and uh, then so this is this is an interesting uh, area wherein uh, we classified the asset we broken the asset into multiple uh, uh, multiple uh, brackets wherein uh, this was the tower detail wherein a tower detail should have a tower number latitude longitude a coordinate what is the tower type what is the type of insulator then obviously foundation inspection in onm is very critical so the moping pooping part the back filling uh, the debris the revetment condition the earthing uh, what, what is the water logging is it water log or there is no water logging right the tar accessories so uh, in terms of the aviation requirement in both circuit 2 so we have divided all these elements as far as circuit 1 and circuit 2 uh, bifurcation so uh, the tower accessories covered the bird gauge the number plate face plate circuit plate danger plate anti climbing device right uh, tree cutting uh, with the help of the radar we also you know, identified is any requirement for tree cutting over that particular asset or not uh, as i was saying uh, the vegetation analysis the tower let is so uh, is there any missing member so this this particular part is covered in this in this particular uh, bracket wherein uh, we do a lot of uh, visual analysis with the help of the drone of missing members hanging members is there any bent part of uh, bent part are there any bolts or nuts which are you know uh, missing uh, any rusting which is there in the in the tower any tack welding which is missing in the tower right we we have also tried and captured the conductor part of it wherein jumper bolts the arcing horns corona rings spacers insulator days and uh, it could be you know uh, again uh, bifurcated for Uh, for for glass for rubber for other kind of insulators are there any missing split pins so i was trying to showing you an image wherein we were even capturing this split pins uh, detailing uh, what about the grading ring of the insulator uh, uh, is the conductor damage is the pilot fitting healthy or not uh, so so now this is a hot spot so with the ir camera we are using all the hot spot detailing uh, uh, of it 
uh, another element is the earthware or the OPGW, which you know uh, goes on the top of the tower, right? So uh, is the jump ring fine? How is the vibration damper? How is the CU bond in that earthware and OPGW? Uh, the four, I mean, the last and the most important is the clearances part, wherein we calculate the face-to-face -face clearance, the ground to bottom face clearance, the earthware and uh, uh, the the face clearance uh, the clearance of the trees which are you know uh, which are just below the bottom phase of the conductor to the bottom phase of the uh, uh, bottom phase of the uh, the, uh, the the tower right we also try and capture the uh, the body and the face clearance right so as you can see so this was the particular lidar span and uh, we did a lot of uh, uh, lidar scanning and uh, as an output, it was good, right? So as you guys can see uh, that there was a vegetation, there was a tree just below the tower and on uh, from the bottom face to the tree top, it was a clearance of around 15.44 meter, right? So for for every, uh, for any any utility or for any, you know, transmission project, depending upon the voltage, the KV uh, rating, uh, all the clearances are, are classified right so the first uh, the first and the foremost exercise for any inspection uh, for any inspection team is to have a dashboard uh, rather to you know to create a, a kind of a, a, a uh, a book or, or a template uh, basically that what all parameters do we need to capture right if a utility will have a template then only they would know that what what parameters they want to capture in that particular inspection right so as i was trying to show you so this is a particular template right so as you can see that uh, we, we we tried to capture the the clearance of the tree from the bottom face right so it was derived as good we were showing the the clearance from the top to the uh, to the first uh, topmost face. So this is the earthfire and the OPGW, and there was a clearance which was you know taken. So all these calculations come into analytics. So once we get the output, we do a lot of uh, 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 I mean we, we do a lot of uh, analytics. We do a lot of analysis over the output, and then we can say that this particular clearance are in line to our requirement or not, right? So in this particular image, you can see that uh, a distance from uh, one phase to the other phase is this much, right? So here you have entire view of the corridor, wherein again the tree distance from the bottom bottommost phase you can see. In here you can see the jumper clearance as well. You can see here uh, at the joint point you can see the jumper clearance which is 7.65 meters, right? And we also try and capture the face to the body clearance. So so everyone can see here. I mean it's a uh, it's 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 basic the jumper clearance which is an important element you know any line uh, irrespective of the voltage KV can trip if this particular jumper clearance is not maintained healthy right so again Rahul, so this is the body clearance from the jumper to the body Rahul, can i request you to wrap it up in one to two minutes yeah sure 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 thank you thank you very much Rahul. so uh, uh, as you can see uh, in the lower half of it so as i was saying we we have also tried and capture the uh, the the visual uh, part of it wherein the uh, bolts and nuts uh, the corona ring were also being you know considered we had also so parking horns so this is how uh, one of the uh, you know the major applications of uh, uh, drone can be utilized so uh, the misalignment of the corona ring as you guys can see here right uh, so the, the grading ring or the corona ring getting misaligned so all these can be can be captured with the help of the drone because uh, no individual or let's say no technician can actually go and do this much of detailing right so i think uh, i am done with this and uh, uh, i mean i'm i'm ready for any query and any questions yeah uh, thank you very much Rahul, uh, for very excellent uh, presentation so Rahul, what we'll do is uh, we'll uh, quickly go through with uh, one or two questions. The rest of the question we will address them at the, before the end of the webinar. So the first question is from Muhammad and Asim, and the question is the data is collected from the sensors mounted on the controller of this drone. So is the data saved locally or transmitted externally? 
no so so if i understood it right the data uh, the data has been collected locally and all this data is uh, is of our project it's it's not uh, a data which has been taken from another utility all this data is part of the sterlight powers asset so uh, for all the 400765 kv we do this kind of analysis and uh, if i if i talk about the payload uh, so payload is basically the sensor which i was saying earlier so you know uh, depending upon the weight lifting capability of a drone you can change the payload so it could be a, a digital camera it could be a ir camera or the uh, the lidar camera so uh, i hope i was able to answer that yes so another question is from miss uh, muniba mazar the question is is drone capable of capturing type of conductor gauge so uh, no so i would say that the drone is not look so as i was saying that drone itself is is not capable of anything right so when i say drone a drone is a flying machine right just like a helicopter we need to put the right sen uh, right sensor just below the drone so let's say for uh, to capture the to capture the uh, different parameters the width or let's say the circumference or the dia of the of the conductor we need to put lidar Uh, just below the drone as a payload, and then we can do all the engineering calculations. But, but I'm afraid, and uh, I mean, uh, uh, as of now, I do not think that uh, any uh, you know conductor classification can be done uh, with 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 the help of the drone because so in any in any transmission line, uh, let's say in India, how it happens that once a project is out in a bidding uh, in in a bidding uh, process. so we already know as far as the the regulatory commission we know that this particular uh, uh, conductor is to be used in this particular line right so we already know uh, the kind of conductor the type of conductor but yes the health of the conductor in terms of any breakage or any you know uh, any physical damage or any uh, any any other any other um, uh, uh, properties of, uh, which which can be you know seen visually can be uh, checked with the drone uh, so i hope i was able to, uh, to answer that very quick and short answer is required from you uh, from the how much Time and duration does it take for the? How much uh, amount of time duration do we have for these drones? So drones, uh, I mean, are you talking about the shelf life or? Uh... Flight, flight duration time. I mean, uh, just the drone can work for like two hours, one hour, very briefly, just give a number something. right so drones are basically of two type it could be a battery or a, a or a gasoline based drone so for a battery operated drone usually the uh, the endurance or the flight time varies from 20 minutes to 35 40 minutes depending upon what kind of payload it is you know picking up and uh, usually a drone for example a dji phantom 4 which is used for inspection across the globe uh, can be used for 1 uh, and a half 2 kilometers at one side Uh, for flying of drone at one side because we need to understand let's say as a pilot if i am sending 2 kilometers drone ahead so it it also has to come back so normally a range of around 1.5 to 2 kilometers uh, so this is uh, in the visual line of sight so uh, there is another uh, technical uh, aspect of beyond visual line of sight but yes in a normal scenario 1 and a half to 2 to 1 and a half kilometers at one side okay thank you very much rahul So Rahul, we are uh, short of time. Although we have a lot of more questions, uh, but we will address them uh, before the end of the webinar. I would request you to be online with us, and uh, sure. moreover, for the knowledge of the participants, or uh, many people have been asking this question. But all the presentations of the webinar will be uploaded on our website after the webinar is over, so you can have access to all the presentations later on. So now I'll go with the second presentation, uh, Dr. Yang Wang. Uh, is our second presenter. He earned his PhD and master's from University of Wisconsin, uh, Wisconsin Madison in USA, and his bachelor degree from Zhejiang University in China. He worked at United Technology Research Center from 2011 to 2015, and then moved to Shenzhen, China, where he founded DY Innovation. DY Innovation is a leading provider of automated drone systems in China, and its turnkey solution for grid inspection has been widely adopted by the state grid and the southern grid in China. Drones have been widely used in inspection of transmission lines and towers as well as substations. Yet most of them are remote, piloted by 
humans on site. Human piloted drone inspection is not a scalable need given the fact that China has more than 5.4 million kilometers of power lines and the number is still growing. Dr. Van and his team have developed a new generation of fully automated drone system that is natively suitable for cloud based applications with no human on site. They have also developed AI algorithms and software tool chains that work with their automated drone system, delivering a turnkey solution to their customers. In this presentation, Dr. Van will share his experience and practices of the so called cloud native automated drone systems in great inspection applications. Over to you, Dr. Yang. All right, thank you very much. And uh, okay. everybody can see my slides, right? Okay, great. Um, so, all right, uh, it's a great honor for me to give you this presentation here. Um, it's more like a very brief history or overview of the drone inspection technologies for grid, uh, the, for grid inspections in China. Um, so, one thing uh, I must point out is that uh, the penetration of drone uses in China, in China, especially in the grid inspection, it's extremely high. Um, and uh, it's very much, very widely used. Um, so because of the massive usage of drone, it's all about uh, uh, technologies that can be massively adopted or massively uh, reproduced. Um, because uh, like what, what was just now mentioned, that China has uh, over 5.4 million kilometers of uh, transmission and distribution lines. And I believe the transmission line alone, it's more than uh, 1.6 million, million kilometers, something like that. So um, uh, obviously, uh, China cannot afford uh, so many human labors to do all the inspections. So all the inspection mm, pretty much must go unmanned. Um, and uh, in terms of the operation range, it must go to beyond the visual line of sight operation. Uh, otherwise, the, the efficiency cannot just cannot hold. Um, so my topic. Uh, today would be the cloud native automated drone system for grid inspection and um, the, the the word cloud native is um, I borrowed it from the cloud uh, computing uh, like uh, business uh, well cl uh, cloud native computing basically means well I mean in the, in the cloud computing business basically means the technology is developed uh, with the with the goal of to like working with the cloud right uh, and um, likewise um, the cloud native drone is drones that are designed for uh, cloud based operations rather than uh, like human piloted on site or rather than remote piloted drones. Um, and uh, I, from what I learned, uh, I seem to be the first guy who <laughs> actually used this name cloud native operation, cloud native drones. Uh, and uh, the background of this uh, front page is. Uh, one of the products of our company, uh, DIY Innovations. One of the uh, products of the company is uh, the fully automated drones, and it's the last generation. We are still using the DJI drone. Uh, it's the Matrice two, uh, two, uh, 200, 200 series, something like that. Um, it has the RTK position system, but um, most of all, during the usage, actually, we use the vision guidance uh, for very accurate picture gathering, and. Um, uh, on the floor here, on the ground here, it's the autom it's the drone base. Basically, it has a robotic arm to swap to swap the batteries. Uh, to it has the uh, industrial grade protections. Blah blah blah. Um, and I believe you've probably much uh, probably have seen something similar. Like uh, I think there's an Israel company called uh, 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 Aerobotics uh, or another called Perceptual. I believe uh, they make similar products. And um, uh, well, in China, so uh, we we do the business in China. Oh, okay. So first, a brief introduction about about myself. Uh, I got my bachelor's degrees in China. Um, at that time, I was doing data mining, <laughs> and then when I uh, went to Wisconsin Madison for my PhD and master, I decided to. Uh, Oh, pivot. Uh, we'll just say that. Uh, so I studied power electronics and the grid uh, utility power electronics. Uh, so it's very much about the, the grid operation. And then when, after I graduated from Wisconsin Madison, I decided that I want to build something that can fly. So I joined United Technologies. It's uh, I believe the, the second largest uh, um, aerospace company maybe in in United States. And then after working for four years, um, I came back to China and founded DIY Innovations uh, to do the automated drone systems. So now we are a leading provider of automated drone systems in China. 
and um, the grid inspection is uh, one of our major business sectors. And, and as you know, uh, there are two state, uh, two grid corporations in China. One is the state grid, and the other is the southern grid. Um, so this is the agenda of today. Uh, first, a brief introduction. Mm, well, uh, in China, so uh, the remote piloted drone operation has been like in use for quite a long time, and um, uh, with some assistance from uh, automated assistance. Um, and then the technology moves into a next era. It's called the automated operation uh, using the drone base and the fully, fully automated drones. Uh, but then uh, the, clearly the, uh, the technological trend is moving to the cloud native operation. Actually, I made this slides in February, I believe. And at that time, there's a, 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 there's a like a, a indications that cloud native operation would be the way to go. And now it's um, May. It's um, very obvious now. Uh, the, both the, the the state grid and the southern grid in China, they are both pushing this, uh, going in this direction. Um, and another uh, technology related is uh, the fault analysis. Uh, first, it's well, uh, like uh, a few years ago, the fault analysis was done by human eyes on site. And then uh, in China, the, the grid companies, they decided that, okay, we need to split the job. Uh, we have the pilots to gather the data, and we have the, um, the office, like office workers, uh, they will do the uh, offline analysis, offsite analysis, uh, like by human, still with human eyes. And then now we are moving into an era of uh, uh, AI analysis or AI assisted analysis. I will give more details in later. Um, okay, so first let's talk about the remote, remote piloted operations. Um, there used to be zero SOPs or standard operation procedures uh, for drone inspection in China. Um, actually, it did help a lot. I mean, the drone did help the grid inspection a lot. Um, but there is no SOP, so uh, different pilots they do the job differently. It's more like a personal flavor, um, like a, even a piece of artwork. They they all create their own artwork, um, and as a result. Um, the, the lack of SOP made it quite impossible to mass reproduce the experience, uh, some ex successful experience throughout the whole country. Uh, different people to do different things. And moreover, um, because the pictures were not standardized, uh, the, the data collected at that time, uh, during that like, like a few years, the data collected during that period of time can hardly be used for algorithm training, uh, like the, the, the the, the AI fault analysis, it needs some training, right? So it needs the training data, but the data collected during that time is very, um, very, very poor in, in terms of uh, algorithm friendliness. Um, and then people realize, okay, we have to have the SOP, right? Uh, SOP is in position, let's, well, let's do something. Uh, but then here comes the problem. Uh, people, the, the, the grid companies, they don't have, they didn't have enough pilots. Uh, they try to train more, but then, okay, the training is very time consuming, money consuming, and then human pilots mm, can not so well, cannot so easily follow, follow the SOP. For example, uh, the, the SOP would say, uh, take the picture like 15 meters away from the uh, whatever that thing is, okay? But then how does the pilot tell if it is the 15 meters or, or five meters, right? It's, it's very difficult. Uh, it's actually, there's no means to measure the distance, uh, things like that. Um, and due to the, uh, due to the limitations of uh, how to carry out the, the, how to properly carry out the SOP, um, the SOP itself was not that successful. Um, the improvement in efficiency is quite limited. Um, and then uh, clearly the answer would be, let's do less training. Uh, let's replace the training with more automation. That's when people started adding more automation to the human to the remote remote uh, like piloting. Uh, the mission is then pre-programmed, uh, and the drone runs the mission by itself with the help of RTK. Uh, the RTK system is uh, supposedly it's centimeter level uh, accuracy, but in reality, when the drone starts to move, it's more like uh, like tens of centimeters, so um, not that accurate. And uh, but still. Uh, uh, most of the time, it's it's good enough. 
And the human pilots, they basically do three things. First is to deploy and retrieve the drones. Uh, second is assist camera focusing because the, the camera is pre-programmed as well. The camera uh, movement of the camera, of the gimbal, uh, is um, uh, pre-programmed, but uh, it may miss the focus and may not be uh, correctly pointing to the point of interest. So the human pilot has to help it correct it. And third is to fail safe, uh, to, to guarantee the fail safe. The drone may go wild, right? And send the human pilots out the, the last defense. Uh, and uh, there are mainly two ways to pre-program pre the mission, um, and both are quite widely used. The first is, uh, we call it record and replay. Um, basically, we, uh, if you look at the picture uh, to, on the left of the screen, uh, a human pilot would first manually operate the drone uh, to do all the uh, shots. Like uh, There are like 11 11 point of interest, right? They will, he will do the, uh, the the picture capturing manually, and then the system will uh, will capture will record how he did that, and then later on uh, the system can replay it uh, automatically with the help of RTK. And that's one way. Uh, and the second way to pre-program the mission is to use the reconstruct and calculate. Uh, that's what I <laughs> I made up a name for that. Um, the reconstruction is done by LIDAR, uh, by LIDAR, sorry, by LIDAR or cameras. It's basically 3D modeling. You get the data point clouds, right? And then you do the calculation. So uh, without uh, manually flying the drone, we, we would know uh, where the drone should be uh, in order to take the right picture from the right angle. Uh, the first is actually easier. I mean, the recorded replay is actually easier and safer um, to, to implement. But the second will definitely actually it's it is prevailing in the long run because it significantly uh, reduces the, the human efforts. You don't need to fly the drone. This in uh, you don't have to manually fly the drone. You can do it like offline uh, with the help of lidar. Uh, so the efficiency is much better. And the DIY Innovations offers both uh, kind of uh, both of these software packages. Oops. All right, um, so it's not bad, uh, but uh, still, uh, the good companies, they don't have enough pilots. Because remember, even with the help of automation, it still requires human pilots to carry the drone to the site and do some all those uh, intervention and uh, uh, like assistance. Um, so we see the, the pros of the uh, such method is that it re definitely requires less training and reasonably efficient, but um, uh, and also the human pilot is quite a, uh, a reliable failsafe uh, because the, the, drone, the drones go wild, right? And then the human pilots save it. The cons, well, uh, on the other side is quite obvious too. The RTK failure is quite often, uh, it's, uh, it's not good. Uh, it definitely jeopardizes both the efficiency and safety. Uh, the, the human pilots, they do not, they cannot relax. They cannot just sit back and relax. They have to keep their eyes on the drones. Uh, in case the RTK fails, they have to take over uh, with, the, uh, with, the jo with the joystick, right? Um, and second, uh, uh, it's quite often that they might miss the target um, because there is no feedback control loop for the imaging. Uh, basically, the imaging is uh, based on uh, RTK uh, positioning system and uh, IMU, uh, so it's quite, uh, Oh, understandable that it might miss the target and there is no feedback. And third, still requires some human intervention. Uh, and um, well, the result is that, okay, it's cool, but we need more automation. Now, it comes to the next stage. That's the automated operation, the fully automated, or we should say fully automated uh, operation. Uh, that's what we built for the state grid and the southern grid in 2019 to 2020. Uh, basically, two types of uh, uh, products. One is the drone base, the other is the drone carrier. The drone base is fully unmanned, uh, fully automated operation, and um, has, like I said, it has the, uh, the robotic arm to swap the battery. Uh, it has industrial grade protections. It carries only one drone, it's deployed uh, in some substations. And um, the drone carriers, they usually carry four drones uh, one driver uh, and pilot, one driver pilot. Uh, and then he carries four drones. So instead of uh, operating one drone, he can now 
I coordinate four. Uh, the four drones will op operate automatically. Um, and how does the drone base work? Uh, well, I think it's quite obvious that um, uh, it's like a box, right? And the drone, when the drone gets inside, um, the robotic arm will swap, swap the battery, they will sync the data, uh, cycle the power, and then before the flight, it, it is the automated pre-flight self-check. And then it takes off by itself, does all the, uh, in, uh, does all the inspection by itself, and then it auto automatically lands to the landing pad. Uh, with centimeter level accuracy it's a, a vision based guide vision based navigation and then prepare for the next round and the drone carrier uh likewise uh, it'll first move to the next stop and then upload the mission arrangement and then the drone four drones take off uh semi automated um and uh, it's it does the inspection uh, with with the uh, with the uh, onboard computing system uh, uh, to coordinate them uh, and then they they will just come back and land uh, one by one with the automated coordination, and then get ready for the next round. Um, how to deploy them? Well, uh, basically we build one mission control center for the grid company. Uh, usually it's a, a uh, it's in the province or in the, in a city. Uh, um, so it's a pro 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 provincial level of. Uh, uh, well, we should say that a provincial level of deployment or a city level of uh, de deployment. Uh, and other than the, uh, besides the mission control center, the drone carriers are deployed in the field teams and the drone bases are deployed in the substations. Uh, they kind of divide up the work. Um, this, uh, these two are some video clips that we prepared. Let's see. Oops. So I'm sorry, it's all in Chinese. Um, and uh, well, I think the network is not that good. You've basically seen the frames. Uh, yeah, so we upload the mission to the drone base and drone carriers. Uh, the drones will take off automatically, uh, does all the inspection by themselves. Um, and the uh, inspection is done by, or with the help of vision, vision guidance. and it then returns by itself, uh, automated landing. Uh, right, and then the drone carriers will retrieve the four drones one by one. Yeah, and then upload the data to the, to the mission control center and uh, uh, there's an AI platform there to do, that does all the calculation. Um, the next is uh, a video clip that we made. Uh, oh, the, the previous one was made in 2019, at the beginning of 2019, and this one is at the beginning of the 2020. Uh, we upgraded the system to uh, work with the DJI M300 drones. And basically, the concept is exactly the same, except the, the functions. I mean, the you know, capabilities of the system is uh, uh, greatly improved. Yeah, I feel sorry for the <laughs> video experience. So this is like frames and frames. So now different drone bases, they can be coordinated uh, to work as a network. And that's again, uh, improved the AI and improved API and SDK. Uh, they can easily connect it to the to the customer system. All right. Okay, some user experience, uh, some user cases, sorry. Uh, this is what we uh, deployed in Jiangsu province in China. So the drone carriers and drone bases, and uh, again, drone carriers and drone bases. 
these are the drone bases deployed in different parts of China. Okay, uh, automated operation is quite awesome, but um, we <laughs> came across some obvious challenges. First, fail-safe mechanism uh, during the automated operation is a problem. Um, there's no human pilots on site, um, so every all the uh, anomalies ha uh, has to be like taken care of by the drone itself or by some um, onboard intelligence or cloud intelligence. And also, it's about the communication range is also a challenge. Uh, the point-to-point -point cloud, uh, the point-to-point -point communication is within the range of uh, like. Uh, uh, a few kilometers, even so in some areas, only one to two kilometers range. Uh, that's no good. The transmission line is very long. Uh, and then it's the flight range. Uh, they have to, after they go out, they have to return to the base. Um, they cannot just hop all the way uh, down the transmission line. And then it's the price. It's very expensive. And the maintenance requirements is quite high. Well, uh, so when, when, when the industry started to review all the pros and cons of this uh, this uh, technology, uh, the cloud native concept kind of unveils itself quite naturally. So uh, what is it like? Um, first of course, it's, it's, it's the cloud native drones. Uh, they can hop from base to base. Uh, and so that they, they don't need to like go out for an inspection and then they come back to the base. No, they don't need to come back to the base. They can hop to the next, next base. Um, and imagine it's not a, uh, a it's a network. It's, uh, the, there are uh, a lot of bases and a lot of drones and they're all, all coordinated in the mission control center. Um, yeah, and also in terms of the maintenance, uh, we no longer need to send our field engineers to the to the field to do the maintenance for the for the drones. They can fly back to our regional service center for maintenance. That's a lot. Of, uh, that saves a lot of effort. Um, and and then it consists of uh, three parts. The whole solution consists of three parts. One is the cloud native automated drone system. It has uh, the the drone. Uh, the landing pad, it's basically a landing and charging pad, and then it's a full function automated uh, box. Uh, and the second one is, second uh, part is the operating system, and third part is the application software package. Um, so we introduced, we talked about the, the, the automated drone system uh, earlier, and now let's talk about the uh, operating system. It's basically uh, a coordination system and an upgrade system. Uh, and then application software, basically it does three things. First, how to fly and how to collect data. And second, uh, how to an analyze the data. And third, uh, the how to uh, visualize or how to present the data, uh, how to present the results. Okay, and then a brief, uh, briefly talk about the fault analysis. Um, so uh, the industry, uh, actually started off thinking, okay, we could get some magical help from AI and um, the AI can handle all the fault analysis. Uh, but then pretty soon we realized that it was a long way to go. Uh, and uh, the reason is quite obvious. First, too few effective data. Um, there are, and uh, second, too many kinds of faults. And three, two small objects. Um, there are even some objects that are pixels. Uh, pixels uh, in the large picture. So it's extremely difficult to train algorithms for uh, given given such criteria. So um, then we started thinking of uh, alternatives. Um, and actually the alternative was, I think I would say quite working quite well. Um, basically the, the AI is used to, to screen out the normal pictures, to screen out the normal pictures, okay and leaving the could be fault pictures to human di diagnosis. Um, and then it saves significantly human labor. Uh, the, the fault uh, percentage is less than uh, 1% usually. Yeah, I think it's about 1% also. So if you can screen out most of the normal pictures, let's say 80% or even 90%, then you're basically saving 80 to 90% of human labor. That's a tremendous saving. Um, but still, it's quite challenging. Uh, again, the reason is too few data, too many kinds of faults, and too small objects. Uh, it's still, it has a uh, some long way to go, but it's going to work. 
Okay, the future. Um, clearly, the cloud native operation will uh, not soon not dominate. So again, when I wrote the slides, it's in February, and I I, I wrote will soon dominate. But actually, it's it is the way to go now. Quite obvious in China. Um, and also, there are some competing, or I would rather say, complementary technologies. Uh, they will continue to exist. Uh, for example, the robots. Uh, there, there are robots um, that they climb on the on the lines, uh, and uh, they have their advantages. They are very good in battery life compared to drones. Um, they are very suitable for no-fly zones, for example, near the uh, the airport. Um, but they are poor in reliability and maintenance. They uh, they are not reliable at all, far from uh, far compared to drones. Um, the maintenance is uh, a nightmare. So let's say if this thing breaks down <laughs> during the mission, and then we have to shut down the power and then have the worker to retrieve it. And um, also in terms of the site, it has very limited site um, compared to drones, very much limited. Uh, and Actually, robots and cameras, they are competing technologies uh, because <clears throat> uh, they are mostly used in no-fly zones. Um, and uh, to be in more details, uh, cameras, they are online 24-7, which is great. Uh, they are very much affordable, which is great. But they have very limited sites, and the imaging quality is quite poor. Um, and uh, the 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 lens may get blurred or dirty, and then you would see nothing. Um, so it still requires some maintenance. And uh, our company, the DIY Innovations, we have started working on the next generation. Um, so uh, the first generation is, uh, the very first generation of our product is a, a automated uh, drone, or 4G controlled automated drone for grid inspection. Uh, using off-the-shelf off drones, uh, 4G control and automated flights, but there is no like uh, drone base or drone pad. And then we move to the current generation. We have the customized drones and cloud-native operation and fully automated operation. And the next generation, we are doing some experiments in China. That's um, uh, we call it joint force, the air-ground joint force. We have the uh, we call it robot dog. Okay, a robot dog. Uh, for uh, some uh, substation inspections and drones for the uh, like uh, low altitude uh, airborne inspections, they are a very good combination. All right, uh, this is my presentation. Thank you very much, and um, uh, questions are very much welcome. Uh, I have some difficulties in receiving the sound from your side, so if you ask question, please uh, speak slowly. I try my best to catch it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Yang, uh, for a very excellent presentation. Thank you very much for your time and for being with us. So I will quickly go on with uh, two questions with you, Dr. Yang, and then we will address the rest of the questions after the third presentation. The first question is from uh, Rudy Simbolon. Is there any effect of electric to drone? Maybe it can damage the drone. Uh, a, I'm sorry. So the question is, do we have in, any what to, electric to ground? Yes, electric. Uh, so so the, uh, I'm sorry. Could, could you could you repeat the question? I think uh, it is referring to the electricity. Is there any effect of electricity to the drone? Maybe it can damage the drone. Okay. Uh, so far, no. Um, I can give you some uh, very extreme examples. Uh, for the, let's say, uh, 110 kV transmission lines, we usually the imaging range is from 10 to 50 meters. Uh, but sometimes with the, but, but that's with a uh, uh, variable, variable uh, how is it? It, 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 with some zooming cameras, okay? And if you have a uh, fixed range camera, like if you're using like the Phantom 4 or Mavic, uh, DJI Phantom 4 or DJI Mavic, you have to get really close to the to the transmission line. That's more like uh, uh, five meters, even three meters, three to five meters. Uh, and uh, it's been very much tested out in China. That's 110 kV, 220 kV, and even 500 kV line. It's fine. It actually works. Um, it the the drone does say, okay, I'm getting interference, but it still works. 
Um, that's yeah. with the transmission line. And, um, and more, ex more extreme examples would be in the substation. So now in China, there are uh, drones are quite used a lot in substation inspections uh, to replace the, the ground robots, uh, to, to replace the, the wheeled robots. And then they get really close to the, to, to the, uh, the transformers, like uh, one to two meters. Uh, and mm -hmm. it's still fine. The drone will, will complain that, okay, I'm getting a lot of interference, but it works. Okay, so good question, Dr. Yen. How many towers can be expected in a day in uh, hilly terrain places? Uh, how many towers can a drone inspect in a day? Um, well, that's a good question. I don't have the number on, my, on the top of my head. Um, they Actually, it's more of a schedule issue. Uh, the, the drone companies, they have their own schedule of, uh, of, uh, of the inspection. And uh, so, okay, the short answer is I don't know. <laughs> and, and we haven't really like tested out in that way. It's more like uh, this thing works according to the, uh, the group company's schedule. Okay, so what we will request uh, you, Dr. Yang, to uh, bear with us uh, for the next half an hour. So we will address the rest of the question with you later on. So we will right. quickly move to about the third presenter. Thank you very much, Dr. Yang, for your time and for your presentation. Thank you. Thank you for your attention. Okay. So now we go ahead with our third presenter today. Uh, third presenter today is uh, Mr. Morris Wrightmaker, who is the business development manager and with Aerial Chronic since 2015. He holds a bachelor degree in economics and marketing. He graduated in 2010 with a commercial pilot license, shifted into the international business with a passion for aviation. Most of the time, the first point of contact for him is companies, partners, customers, suppliers, but he also works on large projects, tenders, and work on strategic alliances all over the world. He's uh, giving this presentation along with his partner, whose name is Mr. Ryan Russo who is the marketing and sales manager for Ubilco Technologies and has responsibilities for training and product specification. He has more than a decade's experience in the imaging of electrical discharge. So over to you, Mr. Morris and Mr. Ryan. Thank you very much, Hassan. Thank you very much, everyone, for still sticking around. <clears throat> Excuse me. Let me uh, share my screen for a second. There we go. I assume everyone can see the beautiful logo of our drone, correct? <laughs> All right, so we have had an hour full of presentations already. I hope that everyone can still um, bear another 25, 30 minutes to uh, to look what, and hear what we have to say. Um, my name is Maurice Reimakers. I'm representative for Aerotronics, and my partner in crime here is um, Rian Rossou from the company Uvirco out of South Africa. Um, the reason why we do this jointly is why, uh, because I believe that as um, a representative for an OEM drone manufacturer, um, you, you cannot do that without a good sensor. And the one of the best or the best sensor in my, in my belief is the uh, Corona cameras from, uh, from uh, Rian's um, company. So you need to have both experts on board. So let's start with this uh, presentation, please. Um, we've started this small video. Um, there we go. Just to get everyone awake again. Same thing, breaks up. There we go. All right, 
this was just basically to get everyone uh, back on track again. Um, Aerotronics, company I work for, um, positioned and based in the Netherlands. We have uh, we are part of a bigger group. So a Drone Vault Group is our mother company, who have their headquarters in Paris. And what we basically do is we include a end-to-end -end, uh, solution for our customers worldwide. We've got a global footprint, um, and of that we use drones, artificial intelligence, Internet of Things, data, um, and provide that in a kind of in a in a in, a, in an ecosystem where all the assets, um, sensors, drones. Um, uh, software integration, training, support, etc., all come together. So our partners, who are with whom we are presenting today, is the uh, is Uvirco, um, because we believe that you know a drone is nothing without a good sensor, and the main asset in that is of course your data, and the data coming from the Uvirco cameras um, in visual, thermal, and ultraviolet are a main necessity or are the main necessity in the energy market. So I'm, you know, as, as we go back and forth, this is basically what now Rian is going to do. He's going to explain a little bit the steps on the, um, how the energy grid is basically um, consisted of. Okay. Well, the inspection with UAV is used at a number of places. Starting from generation, inspecting almost every single piece of generation hardware to the substations, okay, to the transmission lines. The transmission customers usually have their own yards that can also be inspected. The step down substations, taking it to distribution voltage. Distribution lines, of course, and all their customers will also have usually high end um, uh, yards of its own to be inspected. So, that as a general overview, how basically the grid looks like, and everyone is thinking and, and, and talking about okay, it's the energy line, I'm sorry, it's the transmission line, it's the distribution line, but basically. The whole reason energy companies exist is because they sell power and that power needs to come from somewhere. So it comes either from solar, it comes from wind turbines, comes from coal, comes from wherever. So basically all the way from the beginning, you need to be looking at what it is that you either have to inspect or what you have to maintain or what you have, want to survey. So we have identified initially, currently, and I think the previous two speakers have already tapped into that, four different inspection types. One of them being visual for spot missing components, spot incorrectly installed, uh, spot obvious damage, uh, servitude encroachment, thermal, hotspots due, uh, due to conduction issues resulting from thin conductors, unbalanced phases, some types of damage. Corona, ultraviolet, the visual result of electrical discharges due to electrical fields issuing um, resulting into bad design bad installations damage or pollutions and finally lidar using laser time of flight to accurately measure po uh, positions of line footing to detect movement line sagging or servitude encroachment so initially we've got four basic sensors and some of them could be combined and some of them are um, isolated but we believe that there is a is like in general four types of sensors that could be used. But we believe there's also more. But let later on. So we're talking about generation of power, as said. So you've got hydro dams, you've got wind turbines, very popular, of, of course, in my country or, or in, in um, who are positioned offshore um, in the North Sea between Holland and 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 uh, Britain. There's a, there's a huge um, wind turbine farm. Those need to be inspected. And that's just difficult because you know you have to go there with a boat, you have to climb the tower, you have to rappel down, et cetera, et cetera. So we believe, and it's already being uh, done at the moment, that drones are used more frequently to inspect difficult to reach um, assets. 
So Rian knows best what this is, <laughs> and we'll speak about it briefly. Okay, in any form of electrical generation, there's something moving inside the electric field, and that's called a generator. Uh, when the generator's windings start failing, you can get corona discharge inside, which we need to get a camera near the generator to observe it. Uh, in some hydro schemes, those generators are large enough that you can actually fly a UAV into the pit of the stator and do inspection of the uh, coil windings. Same thing with wind turbines. The rotor can be extracted from the turbine and inspected. Yep. So, but it's difficult. You know, to make something easy is actually difficult to do. Um, if you have, if for instance, if you have a look at uh, how the wind turbine blade is is designed, it basically is an airplane propeller. It, you know, as a leading edge, it has a trailing edge. It curves a little bit. It is smaller at the tip than it is at the nacelle. In order to inspect that, there is, as my previous um, speaker said, uh, rightfully so, there is a standard operating procedure to do that. But it's difficult to automate that, especially you know because these guys, you know, these wind turbine, bl uh, wind turbine blades are are white. You've got a lot of reflection from the sun. Um, there might be, they might not be exactly facing down. They might be a little bit tilted. So in order to improve the drone automatic drone inspections, um, it's difficult to do. But we believe that with certain either algorithms or with a certain, you know, uh, tools that you might be sticking onto the wind turbine blade, like, like a sticker where it uh, keeps a reference point. Um, those, those issues could be overcome. But again, there's a long way to go. Similar to here, this was a, uh, this is Moor Hall in uh, Britain. Uh, this is onshore, of course. There's massive wind turbine blades. Um, all the way, obviously, from uh, from uh, you know relatively small ones of 30, 40 meters, all the way to 150 meters. But it really depends on on what it is that you would like to inspect. Is it visual? Is it daylight? Is it uh, a photo? Is it uh, lidar? What is it that you would like to do? Then you also need to ask yourself the question: What type of data? What kind of result would I would like to get? Um, do I just like to get fancy pictures, or do I need to create a digital twin? as an example. So, um, solar panel, because we were looking still at generation, um, there is solar panel washing. But again, you can use this also if you now it's, you know, the, the washing machines are, are, are going down. You can also do that um, horizontally and clean the wind turbine blade. So it, it, it's not limited to only this, for instance. This is done, by the way, with a Hercules um, 10 drone of my mother company, um, Drone Vault in France. So it depends a little bit on your application, but cleaning algaes or bird droppings or whatever that could influence the, you know, the usage of, of, of these assets, um, you then need to look at the solution. Substation inspection. So we had generation, we're going down to substations. Um, Rian, here you go. Presently, in many countries in the world, flying UAVs over substations is still a fairly big no-no. I was quite happy to see that we can now fly them in China. Uh, most of substation inspections is done by, with our handheld cameras. Okay, Maurice, next slide. Yes, sir. <clears throat> yeah. we, but uh, we would leave. Oh, sorry, go for it. Yes. Go. Um, however, these days, automated inspection of substations become interesting in that, for instance, this ball, uh, built by another partner company, can be fitted with a variety of cameras and trained to drive, roll through a substation on the planned course and give you exact imagery, always from the same angle, always from the same position, every time. And this is obviously done with a, uh, you know, we, we cannot do everything alone. So we need to have partners in this. And we have a very strong alliance with Acroline drones in the United States who have ASAC, um, uh, um, who are basically producing these type of drones, these bull drones, uh, among others, in the United States. Um, 
you can pre-program everything. So indeed, if you see it a little bit like your your lawn mo uh, uh, lawn mower or your a vacuum cleaner that sits in a docking station in your house or in your garden um, that you can just put in a docking station in the corner of a substation and it rolls or it drives or it flies um, frequently in an area that is pre-programmed. So going through the transmission and distribution lines, what is it that you would like to see or that what is it that you would like to learn? Um, again, you need to ask yourselves the question, if I have a drone in my hands today, what type of re data result would I like to get? Is it just visual video? Is it visual photo? What am I going to do with that data? So we have visual video. Great. Now you've got visual high resolution. So we, as a OEM, as a drone manufacturer, we integrate a variety of sensors, Corona cameras being one of them from Uvirco. But we also integrate uh, phase one uh, IXM 100 megapixel photo cameras. This is taken with a um, uh, 80 millimeter lens. So you don't necessarily need to fly that close because there's an optimum between the aperture and the um, uh, focal distance of the drone itself. And of course, the object that you would like to see. But all these three different images are taken, with the ex uh, are taken off the exact same uh, image. So the one on the left hand side is the actual one and cropped down, you see basically still the serial number on that insulator. Thermal. So let me just slow this down a bit. Um, Rian, please. Okay. Uh, thermal, as previously noted, you use them to find hot spots on the power line when the phase is on balance, when there's conduction issues, when there's very high intensity arcing activity. Next slide. I am going for next slide. There we go. Yep. Then we are finally going back to where Rian knows best, Corona discharge. Corona inspection. First picture. This is a video clip recently captured uh, showing the output from our Coracam 8 UAV. In this case, we are just showing the visual uh, with the UV overlay. That is the red dots. You will notice that the red dots are on the live end of the insulator uh, on virtually every phase. So this could indicate that the uh, line is slightly over voltage due to a high electric field. You get that. You could avoid it by putting mounting a corona ring. It could maybe be pin corona where the pin is busy corroding. Yeah. So this was indeed done last week or correction two weeks ago with one of the dutch utilities um, companies and they said fly close to that area because we know that there's an issue and indeed you can see it on the video that there is but they already knew but let's say that you don't know and that issue might cause into a uh, power loss it might it might go down into a complete um, uh, power outage mm -hmm. then it obviously becomes a problem. And that's why your preventive and your predictive maintenance comes in. Rian. Yeah. Sometimes you are lucky and you can, well, unlucky for the network, you can find situations where the combination of thermal and corona gives you better insight into the problem. Example, there's an image of a insulator with two discharges on it, looking at the first discharge at the live end, <clears throat> that's a polymer insulator with a in-fitting corona um, based on our information that would cause an outage within four to ten years from its starting. This is the right hand side images shows the second location, which when we look at the thermal image, we can see that there's a faint hotspot. That indicates uh, internal tracking is occurring. That is where the fiberglass rod inside the insulator is effectively burning. And that can cause a failure literally zero to two years from initiation. Since you don't know when it started, it can quite literally fail tomorrow. This assessment is based on the US EPRI um, priority assignment protocol. So 
we covered on the transmission lines already with uh, visual and corona. We have uh, thermal already covered as well. Now we've got LIDAR. So obviously it's uh, laser impulses, laser pulses um, that can penetrate vegetation. It can um, create into a nice point cloud of which you can basically um, do vegetation concentration, 3D modeling, uh, corridor mapping, variety of, of, of items that can be done with LIDAR. We use um, a Slovakian company called Lidaretto based on a Velodyne puck, um, but we also work with Auster, the OS1 from the United States as well. Again, we're now talking obviously what is out there today um, and what is going to be happening in the near future or future um, developments. So of course, X-raying a line is also being done and belongs to one of the options. Um, it's not that you know it's not done that frequently, but it is done already. Line washing, so or debris removal. So um, there's obviously lines that need to be cleared. Um, this is obviously taken from a video that a lot of people might have seen with um, cloth or, or, or debris just hanging on the power line that needs to be cleaned by drones. This is a partnership, the line drone inspection is a partnership that DroneVolt um, mother company has with uh, Hydro Quebec in Canada, where it is a basically a two-in-one sensor. So you have the line core and the line ohm, where the line core is for corrosion, corro um, corrosion measurement. And the line ohm is for electrical resistance measurement. So it is the verification of defective equipment, the lack of grease, um, electrical resistance for a check of junction sleeves or whatever. So again, this is a uh, um, it flies on the line. You don't need to shut it down. It rolls from the tower to tower, and then you can basically lift off and go to the other site. I think the holy grail in what everyone is achieving or would like to achieve is a control room where you've got data centers um, connected to that, drones are connected to that, uh, sensors are connected to that. So everything needs to be controlled in a, you know, kind of a, a drone in a box, as the previous speaker said. Um, the sensor data needs to go into the cloud. The cloud, the drone is obviously also controlled remotely. Um, that is something that we are working on very, very uh, hard at this moment, and we already are uh, showing positive results. Um, but that doesn't go without, for instance, a charging pad. So this is a partner of ours in the United States, Wybotic, um, based on the uh, West Coast, who have charging pads for robotics in general. So whether it's in, in a warehouse or outdoors, see it like a charging pad for your lawnmower or for any type of these uh, uh, robotics. Um, and we basically use their devices for our um, drone usage. So again, you can envision, envision on strategically positioned locations along the line, a drone in a box on a charging pad connected to an, you know, a, a cloud environment, um, taking off and flying in a remote way, doing an inspection. So again, we've got a multitude of solutions. Um, the first speaker already spoke about line pooling. I, I believe the image was taken from the DroneVault website um, because we actually do that. We have a drone that can um, do line pooling. We've got vegetation monitoring, so you can use or integrate multispectral sensors. Um, we've got a Pensar camera. That's a camera of ourselves, which is daylight and a thermal um, with a TX2 GPU on board for smart onboard analysis. But again, the second speaker rightfully said that there's there's a lot of issues with that because you know you've got small objects, you've got calculating power, you've got um, data training. So how do you overcome that? And you know sensors will improve, uh, data analysis will improve, but it it, it just takes time. Um, preventative and predictive maintenance. I think that's a very important uh, item to cover. Um, when you can prevent something, of course, it would be better than um, than to burn yourself uh, afterwards. So, uh, but again, there's not enough pilots. There's not enough. Uh, the infrastructure is just too too large to really cover everything. Uh, we were speaking to a German energy company recently, 
and they need to inspect by law uh, a minimum of 5% of their entire uh, energy grid, um, that would already result into easily, easily um, 20 drones 100% of the time being operational throughout the country. And that's just 5%. So imagine the amount of work that is uh, involved with this, because you're you're not dealing just with the drone, you're also dealing with operators, you're dealing with legislation, etc. Um, last mile delivery. Let's say you've got uh, maintenance guys on a difficult terrain or in a different um, area, uh, you can deliver uh, parts or goods to them, um, going back and forth, maybe from a different uh, uh, center where all those parts are stored. Uh, that's all in that sense possible. We believe in cloud solutions. Um, we have a partnership with Aqualine Drones who've created a, a cognitive uh, Aqualine Drones cloud environment. It's a full out uh, ecosystem where drone data, um, both telemetry and the visual or the, at least the data from the sensors are uploaded into the cloud and uh, analyzed in a smart way. Um, you've got high availability, high throughput, human supervision of course still needed. Uh, and secure communications and data transfer. Um, the near or the future in that sense, so we've got synergy between hard and software uh, programs and operations. Flight planning, micro route planning, so you have to, you know, your flight planning is super important. Beyond visual line of sight and use space. Um, use space is more like a, a legal term for your current um, air traffic control. Uh, because the more drones are going to fly in our airspace, the more difficult it becomes to regulate those. And, and you know, European Union, where we are based, um, I have included already use space, but it's 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 going to become a more important item, where drones will have a transponder, where drones will have um, will tap into some kind of the UTM system, uh, etc. Live data streaming, so of course it's necessary that you have to have um, good oversight of where you are, what you are seeing, how you're going to analyze it, etc. Um, it's all about data, labeling, you know, we work with a company out of South Africa and Labeler who use the images, photo, video, um, sometimes even speech to label that into a uh, platform that you can use for your data analysis. But again, then it's the question, where are you going to store it? How are you going to analyze it, et cetera? Um, complete data collected. So what is it that you would like to create? So you've got your assets, you've got your infrastructure. Would you like to create a digital twin? Is it two or 3D modeling? Do you need to have it in real time or is post-process good enough? Um, do you have an ERP system that you need to tap into? Um, deep analysis, both automated and heuristic just the facts reporting to a maintenance staff. So you can think about the IBM's Bluemix, um, where they, where a work report, where a work order is created after flight um, and automatically being generated. That's basically it. So of course, there, there's there been a lot of information shared already earlier this morning by the previous two speakers. Um, I like what I hear so far. And then, you know, I, I see, see in our, Uvirco's and Aerotronics' uh, um, presentation, there's a lot of overlap in that sense um, with where we are going in this market. I do believe that there's a, um, there's a global necessity for automatic uh, automation, um, but again, to really automate it, you, there, there's still some work to do. Uh, but we also need the utilities companies in order to help us. So we, as manufacturers, we can absolutely support um, in developing the the well then basically the next industrial revolution when it comes down to technology so uh, i'm maurice Aymakis. you can reach me on this uh email address and my partner is uh, rian rosso uh, from Mubirko. thank you very much thank you very much uh, morris and ryan for a very great presentation uh, you very rightly pointed out that many things were overlapped between all the three presentations but the main intention behind the South Energy Center invention, intervention was that different experiences of different region, regions could be disseminated among the participants for their knowledge and their understanding. So I'll quickly move on to the questions uh, for you, Morris and Brian. 
The first question is from Zayed Mahmood Farhad. His question is very expensive thermo vision camera attached as payload may be damaged due to accident. Is there any frequency of such accidents in the past? This was a question to me, I think. Um, in all fairness, yes, it's it's a flying object and things can break. So we know. Um, so we fly with uh, 50, 60, 70 thousand dollar equipment. Um, most incidents that have happened in the past before were due to pilot error. Um, of course, anything can go wrong. It's a flying device. Airplanes, unfortunately, still crash. And the majority, 70 to 90 percent, I believe even close to 90 percent, is human error because they interpret things differently. Um, there's insurance, yes. There's we have everything covered. Um, we do an analysis after the crash, so you get a crash report. We can read so-called the black box of the UAV, and we can relive the last couple of minutes of the actual flight. So in case of an incident, of an accident, we always analyze what has happened, and then based on that, you can go to your insurer or you know, bad luck, but um, oh, there's always ways to, to solve issues, but it's, you know, human error is unfortunately what it is. But um, therefore, we really, really, really applaud training. Training, training, training. Uh, from <laughs> from, from yeah, the right. Corona camera point, uh, we had previously had a crash with one of our previous generation cameras, which after the crash from about 30 meters uh, altitude above ground level uh, required a new camera case and a new main lens and then it was back in business yeah it's not always a total loss so of course there's always you know you you some legislation actually requires a parachute so a French legislation does require to have the drone on a parachute in order not not per se to uh, you know prevent a complete uh, 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 total loss, but at least have a safe landing or a more controlled way of landing. So we can include whatever the necessity is, um, but of course it's it's prone to knowing that things might happen, yeah. Okay, thank you. Another question is, uh, in your experience, are there any technical challenges posed uh, of uh, using the drones? Uh, technical challenges in where? Say again, please. Uh, using the drones, are there any technical challenges by during the usage of the drone technology, operation of the drone technology? Mm, not per se. You know, in all fairness, um, the drones right now so are not the ones that we created 10 years ago. So there's a lot of improvements in terms of connectivity, in terms of um, you know frequencies that are being used fail saves that are behind it so there there's a lot of um there's a lot of computing power inside that is that has been improved and therefore the technology improves as well look at a little bit like your iphone 4 or iphone 3 compared to the ones that you are having right now so there's a lot of improvements technically which become better and better every day um, but we are here at this moment you know, showing and, 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 and presenting the technology as is. Um, and there might be issues, of course. We, we know that the world is different. So operating a drone in Vietnam, like we do, or in the Middle East, in Saudi Arabia, there's always technical challenges when it comes down to um, the environment, for instance. So in Saudi Arabia, it can be easily 50 degrees centigrade, easily. So that's that's a temperature range that we in in, in the Netherlands don't really um, have. Um, in India or in your region, there might be monsoons. There might be you know it might be sunny sh sunshine right now, and two minutes later it might be raining. So there's always some kind of environmental challenges compared to technical challenges. The technical challenges we overcome, we can overcome or can get get close to as possible. I hope that answers the question. Yes. So Morris, another question is. Uh... Uh, does does these drones work during night hours to trace any force? Yes, there's there's you know we've got lighting um, that we can connect to it. Of course, it depends on the sensor that you would like to carry. Um, you have you have uh, uh, thermal lenses. You have 
um, a low light lenses um, but at least we've got you know there's lighting on the camera itself that we can illuminate as well you've got the flood flood lights or whatever so for us a day or a nighttime operations is not you know different and not that difficult to overcome you know the dutch police actually uh, funny funnily said they actually use them mostly at night because of covert operations okay so yeah so it's not a problem yes so another question is from Bhaskar uh, Budan. This question is to Morris and Ryan. You have talked about the rolling zone along the transmission line from hydro cubic. What is the rollover of this technology around the world? Okay, so the Hydro Quebec drone was developed <clears throat> by Hydro Quebec with, um, uh, by, with the, in support of the Canadian government. So drone vault being also a representative, uh, having a representative or having a subsidiary in Montreal, Canada, we basically closed a um, an opportunity together with Hydro Quebec to produce these type of drones. So initially, they were developed by Hydro Quebec themselves, who have a innovations department, and Drone Vault Paris, Drone Vault headquarters, decided that it would be a good idea that we, as a manufacturer, would actually manufacture them. So the over the last seven to eight years, the development has happened. So the drones are physically landing on the power line. The engines stop. On in the center of it is like a rotating device that rolls over the line itself for resistance management or for um, corrosion management, so to speak. So you've got line ohm and line core, basically two in one sense. And you can fly to the other side when you're done, and you can record all the data of the line itself. Uh, Maurice, I believe they, they were asking, is anybody else besides Hydro Quebec using the ah. system? <laughs> Sorry. Um, no, well, because in all fairness, it is a product that still needs to be launched. So that's why you only saw it is already in the in the in the in the production phase, but it's not in a um, operational phase yet. So as said, you know, the last seven, eight years have been on on development. Um, we as a company came on board about a year ago and now it has gone into a production phase so uh, yeah no we're happy to do to demonstrate it and to uh, show it um, in real time but it's not operationally yet at certain um... <coughs> okay thank you Morris. so i suppose all of our presenters are online with us so i will quickly go on with the questions uh, which were specifically uh, Rest to be participant. So for Dr. Uh, Yang, the question is, do you have experiences of uh, drone going wide and how could you control it? Do you have any instances which you have been witness to? Dr. Wang, can you hear us? Okay, so uh, we'll, we'll check if uh, Dr. Bang gets back to us. In the meanwhile, I will uh, go on with the question to Rahul. Uh, how long uh, does the drone fly in terms of hours in one go? I think uh, Dr. Yang mentioned about one and a half to two hours. So, in your experience, Rahul, in India, how many uh, number of hours that can a drone fly? Right. So, as I said earlier, I think uh, it depends upon that what what source is there to power a drone. Let's say if it is a lipo battery. So, obviously, and and the second factor on which it, which it depends, the endurance depends, is the amount of load which the drone is carrying. Right. So, uh, let's say, and the second is if if it's a gasoline based or a gas based drone right a fuel based drone so in the battery uh, based drones the, usually the endurance is at around i haven't seen drones uh, and even uh, across the world the best endurance which a drone can give is around 35 40 minutes uh, let's say you can stretch it to 45 minutes as well uh, but if it is a gasoline drone let's say a tether drone we, we, we sometimes we call it right so uh, then it can go for a few hours as well Right. And it also depends that in, in what amount of vicinity we are flying. Are we are we flying within a substation or we want to do a mapping of let's say lines which are far away from the from the pilot? 
Uh, I would like to just answer the question which you just posted to Dr. Yang was, uh, I think regarding some uh, misbehavior of the drone or let's say some some kind of accident, right? So I have, I mean, uh, coming from the operation that led few projects on ground. So yes, uh, we have uh, witnessed a few of the uh, few of the incidents uh, on the ground while we were, you know, flying over the charged power line. So uh, I mean, interference is one technical, you know, factor which is to be considered while flying over a line, right? And in India, since the use case is, uh, since the work which we have done is is over 400 and 765 kV, uh, both of them being double circuit, right? So we have realized that the interference effect over these uh, drones, especially uh, uh, let's say the, uh, I mean, uh, nothing to do with the country specific, but yes, few uh, fabricators specific to China. So let's say we have got some, uh, those drones have got some ill effects uh, over, the, over the hardware. Right, but yes, as Dr. Yang uh, rightly mentioned, that we need to, you know, for for drone to be away from all these interference, we need to keep a safe distance, right? And to avoid any kind of accident, we need to uh, maintain an SOP and follow that SOP to the T, right? So every drone will have different applications. So uh, one drone having uh, application of, let's say, survey. Another drone might be having an application of, uh, uh, let's say, the inspection. Right. So both the drones will have different SOPs. Let's say different set of pilots flying the different machines. So a different approach in terms of flying has to be considered. Uh, and you mentioned something about that. Could you just briefly, in two, three words, tell us about that regulation? So, Asan, we missed you in the initial. Uh... Okay. Yeah. Yes, my question was that uh, uh, you were mentioning something about the regulations of uh, drone technology. So, could you just briefly uh, touch upon that topic? Right. So, I mean, uh, as far as the as far as the Indian regulation, drone regulation is concerned. So, let's say every country will have a, a drone regulation within its specific uh, within its specific specific regulatory framework. Right. So, let's say in India, it is DGCA Director General of Civil Aviation. In US, it is FAR, and there is an international organization called ICAO, International Civil Aviation Organization, which is uh, considered by every nation uh, for making its drone laws. Right. So I think every country, whether it's India or any uh, European country, all the drones are classified as per their weightage, right? And uh, let's say if I talk about India, uh, uh, drone is classified into four types, the nano, micro, small and heavyweight categories. And we need to uh, take, uh, we need to have a UIN, unique identification number and UA, UAOP, uh, which is the operator's permit to fly the drone. And let's say before flying a drone, a DGCA, which is the regulator here, we need to log every flight in that portal, uh, I mean, uh, online. And then we we, we, we get the permission of, of flying the drone. But yes, uh, as you can see, India being a big country uh, in terms of populations and the asset. So uh, again, there are a few gray areas as of now, as far as the regulation is concerned, right? So I think a few European nations have done uh, pretty excellent in that. Even US uh, has done uh, pretty good progress from the regulatory perspective. Okay. Thank you. So a uh, question is addressed to uh, Morris Ryan. Uh, how much uh, clearance is uh, required in case of a drone within the induction zone? How much clearances? Sorry, say again, please. How much uh, clearance? A drone requires within the induction zone. This question is uh, asked by Javeria from NTDC Samar. Well, Sorry. Like how, how far the drone needs to stay away from the power line? Ah, how far away does the, how much clearance? Okay, there we go. Um, well, <laughs> as you might have seen in the video in the beginning, we actually flew quite close. So, um, we have developed a, you know, there's always electrical magnetic interference, but we know that there is a signal, there's a warning in case it increases. So we have shown that we can fly in 380 kilovolt um, um, power lines um, as close as two, three meters. 
So, but it always depends on the focal length of your lens. So if you are too close, you won't see anything because you know it has, doesn't know what to look at. So a safe distance is anywhere between, let's say, eight and 15 meters away from an object, more or less. But sometimes 30 meters would uh, would be fine as well. So it really depends on your lens setup. You know, are you using a 35 millimeter lens or an 80 millimeter lens? Using a 100 megapixel photo camera or a 50 50 megapixel camera. So, but anywhere you know, we can fly as close as possible. But it's it's for safe reasons anywhere between eight and five, 15 meters mostly. Thank you very much, Morris. So, ladies and gentlemen, we have uh, quite a few more questions, but we are uh, short of time. We had to finish at 11:30, so we have already extended it for half an hour more. So what we will do is we will uh, send these questions to the relevant experts, and then after getting back the answer, we will send back the, 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 back the answers. Moreover, uh, we are very thankful to all the uh, lead experts, including Morris, Ryan, Dr. Yang, and Mr. Rahul, for giving us time and for giving excellent presentation. This was a very wonderful session. And uh, with this, I would like to conclude our webinar. Thank you everyone else for attending today's session of the webinar. We had listened to some excellent presentations during this webinar. All the presentations I have kept on saying again and again that the presentation will be available on Park Energy Center's website very shortly. Plus on top of that, we will uh, upload the recording of this whole webinar on our YouTube channel. The link of that YouTube channel will also be available on our website in a day time, in one day time. We would love to hear uh, from you any suggestions and comments for uh, any further improvement. Plus, you could also suggest us topics of your interest on which you want us to arrange future webinars. The contact details of all the experts will also be available on our website. So, if any participant from any utility or government uh, organization wants to contact the specific expert, they can do so. We have uh, taken the permission from all the experts. We would gladly do that. With me signing out, thank you again for joining us today and looking forward to see you next time. Bye bye. Thank you very much.